Hello and welcome to another episode brought to you by A Free Story Productions. On the 2nd of November 1917, the British Foreign Secretary, Arthur Balfour, made a declaration announcing support for the establishment of a Jewish home in Palestine. This came to be known as the Balfour Declaration. The declaration was contained in a letter sent to Lord Rothschild, a leader of the British Jewish community, for transmission to the Zionist Federation of Britain and Ireland. This created the world's most intractable conflict that has lasted for more than half a century between Israel and Palestine. But wait a minute. Most of you might not have known that before the Balfour Declaration, we had the Ugandan scheme, a proposal that would have changed the conflict and the world as we know it today. Because it is in this proposal that the British had thought about creating a Jewish homeland in the heart of Africa at the border between Uganda and Kenya. Now pause for a minute and think about where we would be today, just in case this proposal came to pass. In fact, it did come to pass. In this episode, we look at the history of the Ugandan scheme. The Ugandan scheme was a vision to create a Jewish settlement in the British-controlled East Africa as a refuge for Jews escaping anti-Semitism in Europe. This story begins with a man known as Theodore Hezo, an Austro-Hungarian, Jewish journalist, a writer, and the father of modern political Zionism. Hezo formed the Zionist organization and promoted Jewish immigration to Palestine in an attempt to form the Jewish state. Though he died before its establishment, he is known as the father of the state of Israel. In this effort, he created an international movement of Jews that led a series of congresses to press world leaders to embrace Zionism. First, he appealed to Kaiser Wilhelm II in an attempt to bolster influence with the Ottoman Sultan, Abdul Hamid II, to achieve his goal. After failing to garner influence with the Kaiser, he appealed to the French, the Pope, and anyone who could influence the Sultan. Sadly, his pleas ended in failure. In 1903, Theodore Hezo had a breakthrough. He had secured a friendly audience with the British Foreign Secretary, Joseph Chamberlain. Chamberlain agreed to look over establishing a Jewish state in El Arish in the northern Sinai Peninsula next to Palestine. But the British representative in Egypt, Lord Kuzon, vetoed the proposal, claiming it would be difficult to supply the settlement with fresh water and to shatter all hopes he said it would cause upset with the native Egyptian people. Nonetheless, Chamberlain continued his endeavor to aid the Zionists. After looking around the entire British Empire, Chamberlain had a place to resettle the Jewish people. Now that he had a place in mind, he met with Hezo and laid his plan on the table, stating, On my travels, I saw a country for you, Uganda. On the coast, it is hot but in the interior the climate is excellent for Europeans. You can plant cotton and sugar. I thought to myself, this is just the country for Dr. Hezo. Chamberlain. With this breakthrough, Hezo, the Zionist leader, accepted the offer from Chamberlain of settling in British East Africa, in what is today known as Kenya, but has gone down in Zionist history as the Ugandan affair. The land offered was 5,000 square miles at Usain Gishu, an isolated area atop the Mao escarpment in modern-day Kenya. The land was thought to be suitable due to its temperate climate and its relative isolation, being surrounded by the Mao forest. Hezo's next move was to convince the other Jews about plans to relocate them to Kenya. Although he was convinced that the Ugandan scheme would not be accepted without any serious debate and opposition by Eastern European delegates, nevertheless, he went ahead. During the 6th Zionist Congress in 1903, he presented the plan to an assembly of 573 delegates in Basel. His fears were confirmed when the proposal instantaneously divided the movement into two. Those who supported Hazel and his plan argued that in light of the current persecution, it was imperative to find a refuge. They further added the new settlement could serve as a melting pot for Jews of diverse cultures, leading to the eventual building of an independent Israel. Hazel also warned that turning down the offer would be a show of ingratitude to the British, an insult given they were the only allies. 
He also argued to the Congress that the World Zionist Organization's capacity to negotiate would be seriously impaired should the Congress choose to reject the proposal. Hezo viewed the benefit of the Ugandan scheme as a locum in case of overpopulation after a return to the land of Israel. However, his opponents argued that acceptance of the Ugandan scheme constituted a betrayal of the Basel program, which sought to secure an officially recognized homeland for the Jewish people in Palestine. They further claimed that the Zionist movement was not to alleviate suffering, but to concentrate on the attainment of the ultimate aim, which was resettlement in Palestine. Furthermore, they said support for Uganda would only create an illusion that would divert their energy and funds from the main purpose, which were desperately needed. After listening to both sides, they decided to put it to a vote. When the results came in, it was 295 against 178 in favor of Hezo's Ugandan proposal. Later that day, the Congress resolved to form a commission whose major role was to send an expedition to examine the proposed territory. Also, that would be Hezo's last Zionist conference, as he passed away a year later in 1903, aged 44. In 1905, the Seventh Congress convened in Basel, Switzerland. Top of the agenda was the question of a settlement outside of Palestine. Well, for that it was time for the expedition to reveal what they had discovered in British East Africa and give an assessment if the land was suitable for the Jews. The commission's report concluded that Uganda was unsuitable for mass Jewish settlement and voted overwhelmingly against a recognized home anywhere other than Palestine and its immediate vicinity. So the Congress dropped the plan. Now, after the rejection of the Ugandan scheme, the territorialists, led by Israel Zangwil, left the Congress in protest and established the Jewish Territorial Association. This group preached the formation of a Jewish collective in Palestine or anywhere else around the world on the basis of self-rule. They attempted to locate territory suitable for Jewish settlement in various parts of Africa, Asia, but with no success. When Zangwill turned his attention to attaining a settlement in Canada and Australia, opposition from the local populace led him to abandon the venture. Expeditions were sent to Iraq, Libya and Angola, but little came of these expeditions. A project that had success was the Galveston Scheme, which led to the settlement of Jews in American Southwest, in particular Texas. The project received the assistance of Jacob Schiff, an American Jewish banker, and approximately 9,300 Jews arrived in Southwest America between 1907 and 1914 through the Immigration Bureau of the Territorial Organization. Later, the Balfour Declaration and the resulting Zionist awakening negated the movement and led to its dissolution in 1925. In 1917, the year the Balfour Declaration was signed, a Uganda chief and statesman plus his followers converted from Christianity to Judaism. This man came to be known as Semei Kakunguru. The community came to be known as Abayudaya, which translated to the people of Judah. Today, the community has over 2,100 followers, living mostly in eastern Uganda near the town of Mbale. Although they are not genetically or historically related to other ethnic Jews, they are devout in their practice of the religion, keeping their version of the Kashroth and Sabbath. Most of these people are recognized by the reform and conservative sects of Judaism. In 1918, a Jewish legion, a group primarily of Zionist volunteers, assisted in the British conquest of Palestine. In 1922, the League of Nations granted Britain the mandate for Palestine under the terms which included the Balfour Declaration, with its promise to the Jews and with similar provisions regarding the Arab Palestinians. Subsequently, this led to a gradual migration of Jews from different parts of Europe, escaping persecution. The migrations intensified before, during and after the Second World War due to the increased persecutions from Hitler's Germany. On the 11th of May 1949, Israel was admitted as a member of the United Nations by a majority vote, officially recognizing it as a state. Aliyah, or the law of return, 
is the immigration of Jews from the diaspora to the land of Israel, which today includes the modern state of Israel. The state of Israel's law of return grants Jews, their children, and their grandchildren automatic rights regarding residency and Israel citizenship. In 2020, an Israel court ruled that the Abayudaya community from Uganda, who practiced Judaism for over a century, would not be eligible for immigration. What is interesting is that when the British wanted to give land to the Jews in the British protectorate, no local chief or king was asked about the idea. But when the Ugandan Jews wanted to immigrate to Israel to practice their faith, a court had to sit and determine that they were not Jewish enough to immigrate to Israel. Also, one should note that the business of resettling people by the British and the Americans did not start with the Ugandan scheme. In the 1780s, a big number of freed slaves were loitering around the streets of London, giving a bad image of the city, according to the British. So they decided that they should send, should I say dump, the poor black freed slaves back to the continent of their ancestors where they came from. So the British made an agreement to have land on the coast for settlement of the freed slaves. In 1787, a naval vessel carrying 331 freed slaves arrived on the coast. The settlement came to be known as Granville Town. Half of the settlers in the new colony died within the first year. The colony would later emerge as Silarion with the capital Freetown. The Americans did the same in Liberia, of which some slaves were repatriated against their will. All this was done in total disregard of the native population. Who knows what would have happened if the Ugandan scheme had succeeded? Well, your guess is as good as mine. But I am sure the world would be different today.